Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to have you here. This is Anna Ritter, and if you've been around LeClaire very long at all, you've probably seen her at, at some point, but Anna is one of the missionaries that has a church that we support, and this is one of the things that, that we always want to, to, to make clear, is whenever you guys give your, your tithes and your offerings, at least 10% of everything that you give to us goes to people like Anna, and um, we're, we're just so honored to be able to to have her here today. So if you would, would you please welcome Anna here this morning? Thank you. It's good to be here. It's good to have you. And um, so just to, so we all can have a little bit of an update on what's going on with you, 2020 felt like a decade, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and so what was kind of going on in, in, in your life in 2020 before the pandemic? If you can think that far yeah. back. Well, I, I work in Toa Baja, Puerto Rico. I work with two ministries. One is a Christian school and the other one is a church. And in both of my um, roles, I just, my main thing is just teaching the word of God. And I love the word. And at the beginning of 2020, though, in Puerto Rico, we were dealing with a whole different crisis because on January 7th, we had a 6.4 earthquake in the southern part of the island. And where I live, we didn't have that much damage to homes, but definitely, you know, you could feel it. Right. And it started um, a series of earthquakes that lasted for months. So we were working with organizing food and medicine and supplies to send down to the southern part of the island because uh, we had just large kind of camps of people all sleeping outside. They were too afraid to go back into their houses because anytime there was an aftershock, you know, your house right. would. Yeah would shake a little bit more. So in the beginning of March, when the first reported cases of COVID hit the island, we really went into a really strict lockdown because they were worried about the virus getting into those camps where everybody was staying, so. And, and so, wow, that's, that's huge. What, what was the, the hardest part of the lockdown? Well, for me, you know, I, I have a wonderful school and church community, but I live alone, so it was just the isolation. Mm -hmm of, um, you know, we had two-week quarantine, and then we, like, I'm sure like you all here, went to try to figure out how to do everything online, church online, school online. So for me, it was just being so much um, physically, like, by myself, and, you know, Puerto Rico is a really group-oriented um, culture, so we're used to getting through things by coming together, but, you know, with COVID, safety meant everybody had to be apart, and I was like, we don't know how to do that. Like, that was really um, challenging, as I would imagine it's been here also. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and for the first time that you've ever been here, there are people online watching you right now. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that's thanks to COVID, right? Yeah, and, there you um, go. But, but how has Jesus sustained you through this entire time? Yeah, I would say, you know, there's the more kind of practical stuff. Like, like you said, people are watching online. Like, it's good that we can see people and talk to people without having to be physically with them. So it was like, you know, FaceTime and Zoom and all those things were, were good. But also it's just um, the word of God. And if God gives you a word, like at the very end of, of 2019, I was praying and I kept saying like, Lord, what, what are we going to do next year? You know, like what's, what's 2020 going to be about? And I kind of wanted him to give me something like exciting, you know, like change or I don't know, growth or some kind of word like that. And he just said, like, well, I'm, I'm going to need you to just trust me. And I'm going to be honest, I was kind of irritated because I was like, but that's what every other year is about. Like, what? Give me right. something, you know, new. And he kept saying, I'm just going to need you to trust me. And then I was reading in, in Jeremiah, and he says, blessed is the man who's made the Lord their, their, their hope, their trust, their confidence. So I, at least for me personally, I feel like sometimes we don't realize how much more we need to trust God until we have you know, things like what have happened over the last year. So I, just his word has really sustained me. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, I, I can relate to that. You know, I, I didn't pray for a, a specific word or anything like that going into 2020, but <clears throat> I definitely, I, I don't know the last time going into a year that I was more excited. Mm -hmm, yeah. 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 than I was going into 2020. Yeah. And it was just so 
incredible. So, man, that, 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 that's, that, that's powerful. That's powerful stuff. Um, and so where are you in, in, in your, 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 your teaching, in your church, and in the island as a whole? Like, where are you all in your reopening process and kind of just trying to find that new normal? We are, well, for our church, you know, we don't have winter to, to deal with ever. So we started in, the, like, August meeting together. That's not nice to say to people <laughs> in Illinois, you know. So they... We started meeting outside, and we stayed that way because, uh-huh. you know, the, the space where we have to, where we set up for our, to meet for our church is kind of small. And so we've been just meeting together outside on Sundays. And then school, we, we, our whole school year was online. We just finished this last week. Uh, but things are starting to get a little bit more normalized as the vaccine's been more distributed. And so little by little, we're kind of seeing what a new normal will be like. So Is the vaccine pretty readily available uh, yeah. for you all? Yeah, yeah. So. It's, been, it's, been it's been pretty good, the rollout. So. Good. Well, man, we, 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 we are just so thankful for you. We are so thankful for your ministry and um, your heart. Like, I, I love every time you're here and just getting to have these few minutes to have a conversation in front of everybody. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for your ministry and, uh, you know, allowing us to partner with you in, in some sort of a way. Yeah. And I, I just want to always make sure I say as many times as I can when I'm here, you know, thank you and thank the church and thank you everybody for their prayers and, you know, checking on me and emails and, um, it's, it means more to me than I can ever express just to know that you all are here. So, And you got to hang out with our Home Builders class yeah. on Thursday, so you had a party with them, That's it sounds fun, like. That's a fun, fun group. That's so. a fun <laughs> group of people right there. Oh, cool. They're all in a different classroom right now, so we'll, we'll brag on them <laughs> next service. But if you would, join me in, in a time of prayer. Let, let, let's pray for Anna this morning. Now, Father, I thank you so much for Anna. I thank you for her ministry. I thank you for her heart. God, I thank you just for her attentiveness to that still small voice in her, her life, the way that your spirit communicates to her, you know, trust me. And God, what a beautiful, beautiful um, thing. And, and so I, I pray that you will bless Anna, that you will bless uh, her time here in the States here, you know, and, and, and as she travels back to Puerto Rico, that, that you will... Uh, just allow that to just be so sweet and as 2020 has been draining on so many parts of our lives may it just rejuvenate her and refill her um, to go back and do your work in great and, and mighty ways so Jesus thank you so much for loving us and and for the callings that you put on our lives um, we love you and it's your name we pray amen Will you guys thank Anna again We're in Jeremiah. How fun would that have been if, like, the verse that you just talked about is what we were talking about today, but we didn't quite get that, that, that lucky. Uh, but we are in week two of our series on Jeremiah, and, and last week, we, as we kicked off this series, we just looked at the calling that, that God put on Jeremiah's life, and, 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 and it's almost like God gave Jeremiah this, this job, and yes, a calling is so much more than a job, but, but, but this really, really difficult job. Essentially, Jeremiah's job, his calling from God was, you are going to be disliked, you are going to be largely ignored, um, you are going to frustrate a lot of people, and a lot of people are going to wish ill on you. Now go, you know? I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the job that God had given Jeremiah, and, and so it kind of just got me thinking, what are the worst jobs in America, 
right? I mean, isn't that automatically what comes to your mind? What's the worst jobs in America? And so as luck would have it, there's this new little website. I don't know if you've heard of it or not. It's called google.com. Um, and and, and they, they are like perfect for, for lists like this. They have all kinds of lists of the worst jobs in America. But before I, I give you my list, this is just a, a compilation of a bunch of lists and, and me going through and saying that would be pretty pretty bad. Um, But before we get to the list, I just need to make this disclaimer that our intention is not to offend anybody with this list, that we understand that uh, somebody's worst job could be another person's dream job. But, But with that said, here's my top five worst jobs that I found from Google. You guys are excited, aren't you? I I can just feel the (laughs) anticipation in here right now. Number five, a promotional mascot. A promotional mascot, you know. And and, and this one, it it was kind of hard for me to include on the list because they always look so happy. But I think the reason that I include it is because my personal worst job is like a first cousin to a promotional mascot. Uh, Growing up, whenever I was 16 or 17 years old, my dad was the head of entertainment at Precious Moments Chapel in Carthage, Missouri. And and so uh, maybe some of you are familiar with Precious Moments. If you're not, go back to like the 90s, and there are these little figurine, porcelain figurines of angels and different things. Well, there's actually a chapel in Carthage, Missouri, which is my hometown, um, that like hundreds of thousands of people used to go to each year. I think it's still open, but I don't know what in the world they're doing there anymore. Um, But as my dad was the head of entertainment, there were music shows and different things. And so one of my very first jobs was one of the, the, the... they, they, they had, oh boy, they, they had these, these people who would dress up like figurines. And uh, I got to dress up as Hallelujah Country Cowboy, which is basically Timmy the Angel, which is their main face or whatever, who put on a cowboy hat and carried around a foam guitar. And during a couple of parts of my dad's show, I would come out as Hallelujah Country Cowboy, and they would make an announcement, if anybody would like to get their picture taken with Hallelujah Country Cowboy, come on up, you know, and so you're in this mask, and nobody can see your face, and you just have to, like, put your hands on your mouth every once in a while, and then afterwards, they would have you go out in, in, the, in the courtyard and just walk around for a while, and people would stop you and take pictures, and July and 115 degree temperature wearing this massive car. That, that was probably my worst job, but it, it was kind of close rela- related to the promotional mascot. I was a cowboy angel figurine. So that, 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 that's probably why that one hits me. The, the, the number four worst job that I have in my, that, that, that I, I, I thought was um, a, a telemarketer, a telemarketer. And I don't know if, like, again, this is a job that whenever I was 16 years old that I actually wanted to become a telemarketer. And I think that the reason I wanted to become a telemarketer is because I was walking around as Hallelujah Country Cowboy, and I thought that doesn't seem as bad as being Hallelujah Country Cowboy. But essentially, you know, I, I, I would always look in the classified ads, and you would see this whole thing all the time. We're hiring for telemarketers. We need telemarketers. And then they make it sound like you can make so much money But essentially, your job as a telemarketer is to be told no over and over and over and over again. So, I mean, it really isn't that fun. This one kind of shocked me, but the number three worst job would be a taxi driver. A taxi driver. And I don't know about you, but there are definitely some days in my life to where I think I would love to just go drive people around all the time. Like, that would be a whole lot better, but whenever you think about, you know, uh, I guess where the majority of taxis are and stuff, it makes a little bit of sense why taxi driver would be on so many of these lists. In fact, the taxi driver, taxi driver was number one on a lot of these lists. Number two, worst job, a portable toilet cleaner. And I can honestly say there are no days that I've ever thought I want to be a portable toilet cleaner cleaner. But the number one worst job that, I'm, that, that, that hit me as number one worst, worst job, and, and you guys, I, I, I can feel the anticipation. It is built up. We are at a crescendo here. This is so great. How about a chicken gender identifier? 
a chicken gender identifier. And the reason that this one, I mean, it, 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 it is on the list is from what I gather, this is a person who works their way through portable toilet kind of stuff. To, you can use your imagination there. To find out if the chicken is a male or a female. So that doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun. Wasn't that so much fun? Aren't you guys glad you came to church today? You feel so much more spiritual right now than what you did a few moments ago. Amen. Okay, okay. Well, <clears throat> Jeremiah, he really was given this, this, this difficult job. His job was essentially go and prophesy against God's people that God is going to use the pagan nation of Babylon to take God's people captive. That because of their disobedience, that, that God is going to use Babylon to to take the people of, of, of Jerusalem and the people of Judah captive. He, he, he was told to preach these kinds of messages over and over again. Preach that God is going to uproot, he's going to tear down, he's going to destroy, and he's going to demolish. But then also, at the very, very end, you also preach that God is going to build and God is going to plant. But two-thirds of the message that God told Jeremiah to preach is all about destruction. And so it's completely understandable that Jeremiah would be a little bit reluctant to, to, to embrace the call that God had put on his life. But God had commanded Jeremiah, do not be afraid of the scowling faces, but instead you must say everything I tell you to say. And not unlike the way that we sometimes can feel resentment towards the bearer of bad news, people often felt resentment towards Jeremiah for being the bearer of bad news. But Jeremiah, I mean, any time that, that, that he would preach, and you can see this in Jeremiah's words, he, it was almost as if he was just holding out this hope that this time, this is the time that they're going to hear these words with a repentant heart. This is the time that, that they're going to turn their lives back to God, that they're going to, to obey the covenant that God had established with them. This is why so often you can hear it in Jeremiah's words, his words, they're, they're dripping with pain, they're dripping with anguish. This is the entire reason that Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, because all that he wanted, all that he wanted was for people's hearts to change, but their hearts, they were not changing. In fact, their hearts were miles from God. God had willingly tied himself uh, to, to these people through this covenant of love. And all that he expected in, in, in response was, was worshipful obedience from these people. But they didn't obey. And they didn't see a problem with their disobedience. And this great hypocrisy led Jeremiah to eventually preaching several just incredibly bold and blunt sermons. But today, instead of looking at one of Jeremiah's sermons, we are going to look at God telling Jeremiah what to say in his sermons. And so if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and open up to Jeremiah chapter 7. And if you don't have a Bible, we'll have the verses up here on the screen for you today. Jeremiah chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, it says this. This is, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house, that's the temple, and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. And the temple is going to play a major, major role in this sermon that God is telling Jeremiah to preach. The temple was the place for, for, for the Israelites, for God's people, that they would go to the temple to worship. They would go to the temple for teaching. They would go to the temple for offerings. They would go to the temple for sacrifice. They would go to the temple just so that way they could try and make themselves right with God. But the temple was also the place, it was the, 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 the physical place that, that held the Holy of Holies, which is where God's presence would reside. And so just to make sure that Jeremiah is preaching to the right audience here, the people who need to hear this message, God tells Jeremiah, go to the gates of the temple, and as people come in, as these rebellious people, these hypocritical people come in, I want you to preach this message. 
This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. And the entire message that God is going to tell Jeremiah to preach could be summed up in this one sentence. Reform or correct your ways and your actions. God is literally telling Jeremiah to tell the people, not just to change your behavior, but make it right. Make it right. You know what that means? Like, 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 like make it right. Make it good. Make it pleasant. And as you can imagine, this was so far from the current reality that the people of Judah were experiencing. Over and over and over again, these people had become, come, be, become indistinguishable from their pagan neighbors. But because they continued to show up at the temple, and whenever they would show up at the temple, they would act like nothing was wrong. They thought that everything was, was fine. But listen to what God says next. He says, but do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. In other words, God is letting these people know, or God's going to have Jeremiah let these people know that somewhere along the line, you've become convinced that close proximity to the temple equaled close proximity to God. But unfortunately, it was not the physical presence of the temple that made the temple holy. It was the presence of God residing in the temple that made the temple holy holy. And so the message is this. If your faith is tied to a place of worship, or if your faith is only active or even considered in your mind while at a place of worship, then your faith is in a place of worship and not in God. If what takes place in a place of worship does not translate to the way that you live your life, then your faith is in a place of worship and it's not in God. And if we see nothing wrong with that, then we are hypocritical just like the people of Judah that God is telling Jeremiah to preach to. So he says, so do not put your trust in the temple of the Lord because putting your trust in the temple of the Lord is different than putting your trust in the Lord. God, he is so much more interested in our hearts. He is so much more interested in our hearts than simply going through the motions and being good at religion. Go to the temple, the thinking of go to the temple and, and you're good with God, or, or, or make your sacrifice and you're good with God, or, or make your offering and, and, and you're good with God. But God, he is so much more interested in our hearts than, than just going through the motions of being good at religion. So doing the things of God or going to the places of, of God, the places of worship, it does not equal being close to God or being right with God. God. And instead of putting your faith in the wrong places, here's what God says we need to do in verses 5 through 7. He says, if you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors forever." And ever. So here's what you're to do. You are to deal with each other justly. You do not oppress the foreigner, the orphan, or the widow. You do not shed innocent blood, and you do not follow other gods. And so God, he is calling his people to repentance right here, but something happens, some, something interesting happens as God is calling his people to repentance. He says, you do not follow other gods. In other words, that is a vertical kind of relationship. I am to be your sole God. I am to be your sole provider. I am to be your sole allegiance. You are to be aligned with me and nobody else. But that's the only part that God says is a vertical relationship whenever it comes to this repentance that God is calling them to. And much like we see in so many other areas of Scripture, we see that, 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 that much of what needs to be repented of is so often in our horizontal relationships. 
Again, we see this over and over and over and over again. Your vertical relationship with God is proven, is authenticated in your horizontal relationships with one another. Your vertical relationship with God is proven, it is authenticated, it is shown to exist in your horizontal relationships with one another. Jesus, he talked about this all the time. We, we hear Jesus talk about this in Matthew chapter 22 whenever he's challenged, what's the greatest commandment? You guys remember this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Vertical. But the second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's horizontal. John 13, whenever Jesus is meeting with his disciples the night that he would be betrayed, and he says, a new command I give you, love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And when you do this, all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. James, the half-brother of Jesus, he talked about this at the very end of chapter 1, I believe around verse 27. He says that, that pure and faultless religion is this. It's, it's to look after, it's to take care of orphans and widows. It's to take care of those who can't take care of themselves. It's a, it, a pure and faultless religion is a horizontal thing. It's, it's, it's our vertical relationship with God being proven in our relationships with God. With one another, and then he would go on to say in chapter two, and and do not show favoritism. Like you cannot, you you, you can't act like that, that that you're you're doing the things of God if you're showing favoritism against one group of people opposed to another. But then you get to the Apostle Paul in in Galatians chapter five, and as he gives us the fruit of the spirit, have you ever noticed how how horizontal the fruit of the spirit are? The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self control. Those are things that are experienced in a horizontal sense. And so don't just think that, that because you think that you're doing the right things in this vertical relationship, that you're right with God, that, 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 that you're close to God. Because God's message is essentially, you know, that, 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 we are to, that, that, that you're to be a person of mercy, that's what he's telling Jeremiah to tell these people. You are to be people of mercy. And I believe with everything that I have, God's message to us today would be the exact same. We are to be people of mercy. We are to do more than say we love God, but we are to prove it in the way that we love others. That we don't hold things over people's heads. That we don't take, care, take, take advantage of the less fortunate that we don't only treat people as we feel that they deserve, but we show mercy to others just as God has shown mercy to us. And God says that if you do these things, then the covenant that I made with your ancestors all those years ago, it will stand true. But in verse 8, God says, but look, you are just trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. It's almost as if God's saying, here's what you need to do. Come on, guys. What are we doing here? I mean, how did we get so far off base? What are we doing here? Will, will, will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury? Will you burn incense to Baal and father other, follow other gods you have not known? And, and then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, We are safe. Safe to do all of these detestable things? As some of you know, I am, a, um, I am a massive Kansas City Royals fan. And I, I, I hate that. I've hated that for so much of my life, but it's just who I am. And, 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 and so as a Kansas City Royals fan, this year has started out great. I mean, through the month of April, you guys are going to get a bunch of information you don't care about right now, but it's important to me. And so what's important to me, please let it be important to you. Um, but the, the Royals, they had like the best record in baseball through the month of April. And then the calendar switched to May. And all of a sudden, for two weeks, they didn't win a single game. They lost 11 straight games, and they went from having the best record in baseball to like the 25th best record in baseball in less than two weeks. That takes talent, you know? 
And so and my dad, he ended up coming over to our house uh, for my, my son's first birthday a, a week or two ago. I don't remember. He was born May 15th, whenever that was. And, and my dad came over for, 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 for my son's birthday party. And, and my dad is the entire reason I'm a Royals fan. We cannot have a single conversation without talking about the Royals. Like my dad will call me about something so serious and we'll have a 10-minute conversation about something that actually matters. And then before we can get off the phone, so what do you think about the Royals? You know, uh, hey, uh, it's just like that's like our I love you at the end of a conversation is we have to talk about the Royals. And so my dad, he came over and, and he said, Andy, what happened to the Royals? And I said, well, Dad, they can't hit the ball. They're really bad at pitching right now. Our bullpen is a mess. We're making way too many errors. We don't throw the ball to the right base. We're making stupid outs on the base pass. But other than that, other than that, everything's fine. And I almost feel like that this is God's version of the other than that kind of speech, you know, other than the fact that, that, that you guys are all blatantly breaking the eighth and the sixth and the seventh and the ninth and the first commandment. Other than that, I mean, you're doing fine, people of Judah. Other than participating in idol worship and child sacrifice, other than committing adultery, and, and other than oppressing the refugee and orphans and widows, and other than lying and slander and breaking the Sabbath, other than all those things, you're doing just fine. But obviously, they were not fine. But because of their close proximity to the temple, they thought that they... We're fine. We are safe. God, with those words, God is implying that, that you are not safe from all of these detestable things that you are doing. And so he says, has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. God was not unaware of their idol worship. God was not unaware of their perversion. He was not unaware of how they treated those they viewed as less than themselves or the way that they treated one another. He was not unaware of their lying, and he was not unaware of their hypocrisy. And so God's question through Jeremiah was, how can you continue to commit so much unrepentant sin and not think that God is going to respond to your disobedience and your sin. Do you really think that you're that good? Do you really think that you're that sly, that you're going to be able to catch God off guard, that he's not going to notice the ways of your life? In our application today, I hope it's pretty clear. Church, we must identify the areas of our lives that are contrary to the desires of Jesus in our lives. We must identify the areas of our lives that we know are wrong, but we have convinced ourselves that it's okay. I just feel like it's wrong because that's outdated. I mean, I'm not as bad as other people, and so... So yeah, it might be wrong, but it's okay. It's not as bad as, as what others are doing. But even more than that, we have got to develop and ask God to give us ears to hear and a heart to feel that we will be convicted, that we will be able to identify the areas of our lives that are wrong, but that we think are right. And that's hard. But that's what we have to do. We must identify the areas of our lives that cause us to abuse God's grace by just continually going over to him again and again and again and again and again with no idea, with, with no intention of surrendering, with no intention of changing. God will forgive me. It's fine. You're just abusing God's grace. And instead of doing those things, we must humble ourselves to live a life of full and complete surrender to Jesus. We must show mercy to others when they deserve it and when they don't deserve it. 
We must look after the abused, the downtrodden, the oppressed, the orphan, the widow. We must love just as Jesus has loved us. Because God wants so much more than our hypocritical rituals. He desires for our hearts to be transformed so that we may be the people that he desires for us to be. That we will be people who are full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. That we will be people who live out the pure and faultless religion looking after orphans and widows and all of those who are overlooked by society. To be people who prove that we love God in the way that we love others. To be people who are not content with our stinky behavior, but instead we live lives of repentance, not just to change, but, but to make things right. I love how the Apostle Paul says this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. He says, but whatever happens, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Church, those of you who say you are a follower of Jesus, whatever happens, Conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live a life that shows, not just knows, but shows what Jesus has done for you. Because God wants so much more, so much more than our hypocritical rituals. That he desires for our hearts to be transformed so that we can be the people that he desires for us to be. Will you pray with me this morning? Father in heaven, I thank you for, for today. And Father, I pray in, in, in this moment for our hearts, and I pray the Holy Spirit that you will convict us where we need to be convicted. And it is so easy for us to, to, to find ourselves in a rut to just keep doing the same things on the same path over and over again. And sometimes it can be so difficult to get out of a rut. But I pray that you will help us to identify the areas of our lives that are not in line with you. And God, that you will just continue to convict us over and over and over again until we realize that we are off track that we've just developed a rut that we're comfortable in, but God, that it's not, it's not on the path that you want us to be on. And so, Father, I pray for us that, that, that you will just move in our hearts, God, that you will help us to live a life that is worthy in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ, of the good news of Christ, of the hope of Christ. So, Jesus, thank you for giving us hope. Holy Spirit, thank you for convicting us even when it hurts. And God, please give us the humility to respond to those things. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. And right now, we're going to move into our time of communion and worship. And if you didn't on your way in, we have a couple of tables back at the back of the auditorium to where you can go and grab uh, some prepackaged communion. And over the course of this next song, we want you we, we we want to invite you to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. To remember what it is that to, to remember this gospel of Christ that that Jesus lived a perfect life that he took your sins upon himself and he was murdered with your sins on him on the cross. But he defeated your sin, and he defeated death, and he gave us the hope of eternity. He gave us the hope of life, not just in, in the future, but now in this moment, in his resurrection from the dead. And so today, as, as we take the bread, which represents his body, may we remember his sacrifice. Whenever we take the blood, the, the, the juice, which represents his blood that we shed, may we remember his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy that is available to us. And, and if you need prayer today... Uh, Daniel and I, we will be up here, and we'd love nothing more than to have the opportunity to pray with you this morning.
to be able to talk to you about what's taking place in your life, to talk to you about what it looks like to live a life that is worthy of the gospel of Christ, to be able to to talk to you about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So if you have a decision to make, if you, if you need to repent of some sins, if, if, if you need just prayer today, we would love nothing more than to do that. But if you would, please go ahead and stand and remember the sacrifice of Jesus as we sing.